Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. We've traveled the course of an extraordinary life in the series about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. Now, we'll reflect on a legend who used her seven decades of being in the spotlight to do real things for real people. I'm Katy Perry, and it's been an honor to be your guide on this journey. And this is Elizabeth I. Well, I think there are times when being famous is useful when it comes in handy, and if I or any other celebrity can help, then we should do everything we can. I think that's the only reason for being famous. To wrap our arms around a life as big and influential as Elizabeth Taylor's, we asked some questions at the beginning of this series. How did Elizabeth shatter an era of silence around a pandemic? What does it take for a lone individual to step into a moment and transform the words and deeds of everyday people, political leaders, and cultural standard bearers. What kind of person can influence the most powerful people and institutions on the planet to change the world? To answer these questions, we dove deep into a life well-lived, exploring all of Elizabeth Taylor's firsts. Elizabeth was the first to negotiate a million-dollar deal. She was the first born practically into the studio system, broke away, did this major movie, Cleopatra, which literally broke the studio system that had birthed her. She was the first celebrity to be denounced by the Pope. She announced, I'm getting sober, I'm going to rehab, I've got a problem, and just letting you know. She changed the face of what rehab looked like, what getting help for something that is not anyone's fault. And she took the shame away. AIDS, AIDS is different from other diseases. It is not sympathetic. And in the beginning, especially, nobody wanted to do anything about it outside of the gay community. There was even trouble within the gay community because some people didn't want to hear, you know, we didn't want to hear that we can't have sex now because there's this disease. When sex was the expression of homosexuality, Elizabeth stepped in early on and spoke out loudly about the shame and about the judgment and about the absolute unfairness, the way that the heterosexual community, the government was treating these people as though they, they didn't matter. And it was crystal clear to Elizabeth what she needed to say, what she needed to do. And it was also clear that she didn't, there was no time to waste. She was not the first celebrity to have a fragrance, but she was the first celebrity to have a fragrance empire and the beginning of that kind of brand. Elizabeth had been a brand. There was an Elizabeth Taylor brand. As people talk about brand today, Elizabeth was a big fucking brand. Decades ago, she was the first. By exploring the firsts of Elizabeth, we found a roadmap. We heard from those still with us who were at Elizabeth's side through her journey. In their testimonies, certain themes emerged, repeating themselves from person to person, one chapter to the next. 
and we found life lessons emanating from Elizabeth's passions, experiences, and DNA. In these lessons are the traits of a true influencer, the characteristics of a woman whose words and deeds impacted millions of lives. And ultimately, they are the traits that generated a wild success for Elizabeth and everyone with whom she partnered. As we peel them back, we eventually reach Elizabeth's core, the singular element that drove every aspect of who she is, the life she lived, and the influence she wields. To begin, there is authenticity of staying true to yourself. She dominated everything because she, things kept happening. And her life was more dramatic than any film role she ever played. It overshadowed everything else. So what Elizabeth had to do was be true to her authentic self. Her motto was to thine own self be true. And she had to really hang on to that. And, and, and she did it. The best things that may be created are created by people who are genuinely passionate and true, and the story that they tell is true, and it represents them. They take ownership of it, and it's evident. And I mean, she owned her fragrances as much as anybody could own any creation that they possibly would have. She touched it, whether it was the package or whether it was the fragrance or whether it was the advertising. She wanted to make sure that she had clearly af affected the development of it, and it really bared her stamp. The work was genuine. The, the things that, that were made were made because she would bring down a piece of jewelry from her bedroom and say, this is what would be inspiring for me to see be created. Use this color of ruby red and you create this red bottle. This is the kind of story I want to tell. And they went from concepts to something that was her own, to her lens that became beautiful products that women liked and wanted to own because they were her, they were true, they were genuine. When someone is authentic, when one is fully self-expressed, every part of one's nature is there, front and center, to be witnessed and shared. Woven through Elizabeth's true self is her womanhood. She just owned being a woman in the way that is specific and genuine to her and embraced the power that came from it. So there's, there was a moment when we had arranged to, to bring Elizabeth to New York to have a strategy meeting with all the big wigs at Simon & Schuster. Elizabeth was staying in a nice hotel with a suite. We were at this conference table in her suite awaiting Elizabeth. You have to understand that guys like Simon & Schuster, they have been around the block. These are the ultimate salesmen in the field. You cannot tell them that something is the first time ever without them looking at you like, seriously, get a life. These are not guys easily impressed, bowled over, whatever. They don't change their numbers and what they think they can sell. It's like talking to concrete. And so, so we're all at the table, uh, one of whom, the CEO, uh, was uh, an old friend of mine and with whom we first pitched the book. And he was there. And I don't think he'd met Elizabeth at that point, but he'd met everyone else. And we were very involved with the Christie's people and had gotten a great relationship going with Daphne Lingen there and everyone else at Christie's. And anyway, Elizabeth swans into the room. She's wearing this caftan and she's got this, her hair is beautiful and the lipstick. And she walks in, she goes, hello boys. Oh my God, you should have seen the men at this table. Every single one of them became 11 years old. It was hysterical. I mean, I was just dying because I thought if I look up, because I knew if I met her eye, I'd get this wink, like, can you believe these guys? But I thought, this always happens to her. And even though she was at the head of the table, she's flanked on either side by two men and then all these other guys with their notebooks and all this stuff. And I mean, they had to loosen their ties. They were just like schwitzing. You know, they were so like excited to see her. 
they've got their chin in their hands and they're just looking at her moonstruck, moonstruck. Again, like what she said to me, you know, do you want to tell me your book idea? Should I tell you mine? She said, well, I, I know we're having a meeting to discuss how to launch the book. Should I tell you some ideas I have? <laughs> Every single one of them. Yes. Tell us. Tell us. You know, we're nabobs. We don't know anything. That was Elizabeth in action. That was a woman in control. That was a woman who knew how to harness power, how to use it. That was the woman who said to the guys, you know, for Cleopatra, I'm doing it my way or no way. And that was the same person. That was the same guile, genuineness. And so when I say Elizabeth as a pitcher, you didn't know if you were getting a curveball or spitball. You didn't know what you were getting, which is kind of partly Elizabeth. But also, it's what made her such an astute and adroit businesswoman. I mean, this is the woman with the best-selling celebrity perfume. Why? Well, Elizabeth, sometimes you don't have to overthink something. The most important thing was not to overthink Elizabeth. She was always going to surprise you. I have edited books on feminist art. I consider myself strong. The lessons are like ripple effects because watching Elizabeth, reading about Elizabeth, experiencing Elizabeth, she was very consistent. She was strong. She was incredibly big hearted. But I must tell you that day with Simon and Schuster, I knew right then that we were moving markets because they understood. They had seen the book, but now they really understood that they needed to harness that power and go out and sell. Elizabeth wowed those fellas, and these were not fellas that could be wowed. We all have an Elizabeth Taylor in our lives, someone that is super chic with great taste and impeccable style. Maybe it's your mama, mine is obviously Stassi Schroeder, or maybe it's you. At Rakuten, we're here to help these fashionistas get the styles they love. How, you ask? By helping you shop like a pro and save money with cash back. Y'all know how much I like to save money. So wow your party guests with a perfectly decorated home, put together a chic AF party outfit, and killer makeup look. It's all possible with Rakuten, where you can get cash back at thousands of stores, including Nordstrom, Ulta, and Nike. The hottest sales of the year are happening right now, and we'll make sure you get the most savings plus cash back on top of that. It's like getting paid to shop. How's that for a little holiday magic? Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. So we're getting ready to go to this press conference, and this is the first time that I saw Elizabeth made up. I mean, it was just really surreal. So I'm in the elevator waiting, you know, everything has to be prepared and set. So when Elizabeth comes, we go, she's not going to wait. So she walked into the elevator and she's wearing this tight royal blue Terry Mueller suit. Her hair is done. Her makeup is done. I never witnessed anything like that before. She was the most gorgeous woman that I had ever seen. It was breath. She was breathtaking. She was stunning. She just felt like the classic woman. It felt like she was really feminine and really tough, but she never lost her, her, her connection to being a woman. She was always that and just seeing her with, with everything and standing there and it just, I don't know, it was, you, it, you, there was nothing to say. You just couldn't speak so much of her power not just in that moment but perhaps especially in that moment um her power came out of her femininity about it came from the fact that she was a woman and i think um that that was always the case for her she was such a a, a female force for good you know the the kind that i think that 
those of us who consider ourselves to be feminists, or even if you think historically about so many female leaders going back thousands of years, she really embodied that female power of goodness that, like we said before, really it came from her heart and her compassion. But instead of using that in sort of perhaps what we would consider sort of traditionally feminine ways, she used it to be empowered. And I think that people connected to her as a woman in a way that they would not have heard a man say the same things and connect in the same way. Let's go deeper. What do we see underneath the authenticity? What is its anchor? Courage. Elizabeth's ability to take action in the face of fear or intimidation and remain true to herself. In fact, she relied on herself, on her instincts. By trusting her instincts, she could step into the unknown. She could face anything. Courage to be who she is, despite what was written or said about her. Courage to love and love again, even after heartbreak and loss. Courage to reach out to others and let them reach out to her whenever help is needed. Courage to let go when one needs to let go and to hang on through all the hardships, even when death is at your door. Courage to persevere. I'm very, a very determined person. (laughs) I think that's why I'm still alive. Oh, I've been pronounced dead. I've read my own obituaries. And they were the best reviews I've ever read. Letting others down is not an option for Elizabeth. Not if she could help it. Which brings us to loyalty and focus. These traits travel together throughout her life. They are the secret ingredients to her longevity. As a mother, a friend, a businesswoman, an influencer. From the people in her life, to her projects, to her advocacy... Elizabeth was as loyal a partner as one could imagine, and she kept her focus where it was needed most, on her kids, her career, her loves, and the battle against HIV-AIDS. Loyalty and focus. I didn't have to worry to be myself. I felt very supported, supported by her. And she went to bat for me. She literally went to bat for me. You know, I had issues with my father. I, there were times I, I, would, I wouldn't want to say something because I, she would just pick up the phone and just, you know, just let him have it. I just went, oh, my God, no, 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 no. But she really was. She was such a lioness. And there was nothing she was, wasn't afraid of doing. And she had such an incredible magnetism. Like there's nobody that could call my father to tell him that he had done something like he was not treating me fairly. And, but she had done it in such a way that she wrapped him up at the same time. So she's standing by me. He doesn't feel um, that he needs to be defensive. She stood up for me whilst being able to hear my father. And so she was just, she had this incredible power of being able to understand the gravity of a situation, try and address it, and fight for what's right, but not lose the fight. That, like, that's an art. She did that for me time and time and time again. She had such a way, the way she would confront my father about things I felt hurt by, she was able to do it in such a way that it was even able to maybe endear me to him. When she got involved, it, it changed everything. It, first of all, gave incredible hope to people with AIDS because they knew they could rely on her to lead, her, lead their fight and lead their battles. And I'm sure it had enormous impact on people across the country uh, on how to think about this because there was such stigma and such discrimination and such mistreatment of people that I know she had an impact on that. Her commitment to it was not wavering. It was sincere. It was intense. 
and it was permanent. She didn't do this for anything other than the fact that she cared and she was committed. She didn't do it for publicity. She didn't do it for what people thought about her. She did it because she had to. It was, it was she was driven to do this, and her impact was worldwide. I mean, everybody, everybody looked up to her for that. We, I wrote speeches for her when she would go to France and to Greece and to Japan, and and everybody loved her anyway. But they had a deep love for her now that she was willing to be voice for care for people with AIDS and education and research. It was immense. It was enormous. No one could, no one else, I don't think anybody else could have been as successful. In terms of first, you know, she was, we talked about the the fact that she was first, she was the first person to lobby Congress and to obviously lobby the president. She was in front of Congress at least twice, and she did it readily and without hesitation. She was, you know, like I said, she was committed. And the AIDS funding, that was true that, you know, after she talked to Reagan, the funding doubled the next year. She was the first celebrity to get involved and commit herself in perpetuity. I mean, it was a lot of celebrities get involved in events, they get, in, get involved in causes, but it wanes. It's up and down. And with her, it was never up and down. It was always at the top of her priority. Elizabeth got through things because she was a survivor. She paid attention. She didn't let anybody tell her she couldn't do something. You just have to have a lot of confidence in yourself. We didn't have the Me Too movement when I was young and stupid and learning. You really have to focus and keep your eyes open and learn from whatever opportunities you have. Was I really fortunate to have Elizabeth Taylor? You bet. Do most people have somebody like her? No. But I tried to learn everything I could, and it wasn't easy. There were so many nights that I would just cry because I didn't know what I was doing and I'd have to learn. I mean, even with that case that we talked about before, I didn't know real estate law, but I had to learn it. It's really important to have somebody in your corner. And for me, it was Elizabeth. She was in my corner. Keep digging. Underlying loyalty and commitment are two dominant traits. Think of them more as her natural state of being, as constant as the stars above and eternal gemstones below. Empathy and generosity. We've seen them both in every episode. They too are intertwined. For her, generosity came from her empathy, from her deep connection to others. Elizabeth could feel. She feels and sees humanity in every facet of the people around her, even in strangers who filled the spectrum from loving her as fans to suffering in hope of a cure. To people, to others, she was and is connected. People meant everything to Elizabeth. And her rich generosity, not with material things, but with her time and attention and focus and energy, her generosity was her pathway for connection. Through Elizabeth, we've learned that generosity is the expression and advancement of empathy. Giving of oneself to others without expectation from a place of love is how we care for one another. And in Elizabeth's case, she brings to that mix the elixir of good humor. Aside from her kindness, and that might be the biggest thing, what struck you as most unique about your grandmother? Her very rude sense of humor. I mean, by rude, I don't mean rude to people, but just like dirty. <laughs> and and she, lo she really loved to shock people because, you know, that's not what people expect from Elizabeth Taylor. But the real Elizabeth Taylor was like brassy. It was great. She lived to shock people very disarming if you meet somebody for the first time and perhaps that person might be intimidated by meeting a very famous woman but then she'd just totally <laughs> surprise you by saying something you know swear swearing or 
she had a very loud, like full of life laugh. I don't know how to how else to say it. It was just like she would just say something off the hook and just laugh about it so loud. It would just be like you can't really you can't be nervous around somebody like that. She didn't take herself too seriously. You know, she wasn't, she didn't make jokes at other people's expense. She was really just about life situations. I don't know if I told you the story about the one time that I came up and she was not feeling well and she didn't want to meet with me. And I told her, I said, look, I brought roses from my garden or Tim told her that. And she said, tell him to stick the roses up his ass. She had a great sense of humor. But needless to say, I went up and met with her anyway. I told her, oh, no, 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 that's not going to work. And uh, and she she did meet with me. The playfulness rubbed off on everyone around. The humor and fun of Elizabeth Taylor was contagious. There was a time when Michael Jackson called and I answered the phone. Hi, it's Michael. May I speak with Elizabeth? I was... Totally starstruck. Oh my God. Hold on. Put him on hold. Run upstairs. Elizabeth's fast asleep. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Michael Jackson's on the phone. And she said, What? Why are you waking me? Michael's on the phone. I'm sleeping. Tell him I'll call back. So I went downstairs and I explained that to him. And I realized then that I had to steal myself. I did not know who was going to be on the other end of the line. So one day, sitting at my desk, Cher calls. Oh, hello, Cher. How are you? Well, but I just need to apologize because Elizabeth sent me flowers and I didn't send a note and I feel terrible about it. And I said, well, you know, she has been complaining about that. She said, where the hell is my note from Cher? And Elizabeth's not Cher. <laughs> <laughs> and and she was like, what? And then she said, oh, God, OK. She got that I was joking. But I was ready for anything at that point. Humor was an expression of Elizabeth's own humanity and all that that means. She was enjoying life, sharing that enjoyment, and knocking herself off a potential pedestal that anyone who didn't know her may have put her on. She brought herself down to earth for others by shocking people with her normalcy. Because despite all the glamour and largeness of her life, Elizabeth was a human being herself. In fact, I've been told she would despise being painted as someone without flaws. That would be, frankly, disrespectful. And in pure Elizabeth form, she wears her flaws outwardly and honestly as a testament to her humanity. For example, her struggle with addiction and perhaps her judgment in some relationships are two with which so many of us can relate. And then there's the one flaw that seemed uniquely Elizabeth. One that almost everyone in her life experienced. Elizabeth Taylor could be, not all the time, but sometimes, she was late. Not a things are running a little behind kind of late, not just here or there, tardiness. No. This was galactic lateness. It was a thing. I'm sure that if you've spoken to Barbara and you've spoken to Tim, that you've heard that Elizabeth Taylor, as wonderful, as elegant, as intelligent as she was, wasn't famous for being prompt. I would put it like that. When I went to meet her, it's true, my manicure was actually shot by the time I met her. Because Elizabeth, Elizabeth had a, a very fluid sense of schedules and time. You might have heard this. Yes, it was, it was very fluid. It was so fluid, it was running down the steps, it was so fluid. But um, I never cared. I simply never cared. So, so Elizabeth has her first fragrance passion. Shen Sam is involved. And Shen set up a fragrance tour for Elizabeth. So Elizabeth was actually, and people have a hard time believing this, including me back then, Elizabeth was very shy. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. And I was at parties with her, and I was at events with her. And, you know, she just wasn't 
holding court in that way. So uh, Elizabeth agreed to do these fragrance tours. So that meant a store appearance at a department store in Chicago, then to North Carolina, then to Houston, then to San Francisco. So it was like six, seven states where she would go and do these store appearances and, and they would had a Q&A. 10,000 people were showing up. It was crazy department stores that weren't set up for crowds like this. Uh, you know, they're in the aisles, they're around the hanging racks with all the clothes. People are just everywhere. And Elizabeth came out and she did Q&A for a half hour or 45 minutes. And Shen organized those perfume tours. So that was, all of that had to be organized in advance. So, and Shen was obsessively trying to make sure everything was perfect. One time, Shen, because Elizabeth had a reputation for being late on occasion, and Shen set every city up an hour later. She told Elizabeth, you need to be there at noon. The thing didn't start till one. On that fragrance tour, Elizabeth was on time in every single city. That was one that I was on, so I can attest to it. And Elizabeth let Shen have it. While we can't all have the lavish lifestyle of a world-famous celebrity, we can treat ourselves to something nice during the holidays. Rakuten is here to help with that. Whether you're buying gifts for others or for yourself, you can get cash back at thousands of stores. We're here to help you save money, find the best deals, and get more bang for every buck. Head to Rakuten and get cash back at stores you love, like Macy's, Aveda, Lancome, Michael Kors, Ray-Ban, and more. With the cash back you earn, you can make your holiday season as lavish as Cleopatra. <laughs> well, almost. Wow your party guests with a perfectly decorated home. Put together a killer party outfit and makeup look. It's all possible with Rakuten. It's like getting paid to shop. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. And one day, I was picking her up. We were going, I can't remember where. And I walked in the house. And how late is Elizabeth? I say to the person who was there, oh, no, no, she's already in her bath, so it won't be long. I thought, oh, my God, she's in her bathtub now. Then the makeup and the hair, I can't stand it. And what she really did, she would put on the makeup, do, do everything, and have her bath at the end. So once she had got out of her bath, all she had to do was put on her clothes and she was ready. So that took 10 minutes. And I tell you what, I think it's a great idea. And I've done it ever since. <laughs> I don't look the same. Because if, if if you don't have your bath afterwards, you do it before, then you have to fuss with your hair and your makeup and you don't relax in your bathtub because you're running it. So have your bath once you're all ready, except for the clothes. And I promise you, I've told it to a few friends, and we've all done it. And it's great. Try it one day. You're really completely relaxed. Yeah, you don't have to do anything anymore. I think it's such a great idea. I'll admit one thing. I run late also. So for me, I needed her to be late sometimes because I wasn't ready. So I'm like, you're fine. Let me do the 14 things I need to do. And you take your time, and we'll keep them at bay. No, I was not responsible for her being late. Maybe a couple times. I don't. I didn't think I've made her late for like getting to you know the White House. I when I, the one time was Buckingham Palace when she became a dame, but when she had her investiture. And I had to meet with the Buckingham Palace people. I don't know if there's an official title for who they are, but I don't know. The Buckingham Palace people. So I met with her in the lobby of the Dorchester. And I basically said, okay, they had a whole protocol. And, you know, it's like, okay, we have to, this is what's happening here. This is what's happening there. This is what blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, I think something we should talk about is what happens when she's late. And they looked at me dramatically. Well, she can't be late. Well, 
I'm sorry, but she could be late. And we need to figure out how that's going to work because there's protocol. I understand the queen has to, everyone has to be in the room when the queen comes in the room. And so they're like, no, she will miss the investiture. The gates will close and she will not get in. And I said, okay, let's see what happens. And that morning she was all ready. The time had hit and she's futzing with her mascara and she has to reapply her lipstick and oh, get me a comb. So I said, Elizabeth, you've got to go. And I started to freak out and I didn't normally take this firm a tone with her, but I literally pulled her off the chair and pushed her out the door because she couldn't be late. The gates would close. But you know what? There's a lot of footage. There's footage with her and Julie Andrews in a, in a room, in a holding room with the guards and everything. And they're walking Elizabeth and Julie Andrews through the whole thing. But you know what? She wasn't going to be late because they had already put in a big buffer of time. So I'm happy that I stood strong and made sure I... You know, she had her kids with her and there's only a certain amount of people. So I didn't go with her, but I'm glad I pushed her out the door in that case. Uh, but you know what? It would have been okay if she was late. Being late was an element to being Elizabeth. It was part of her complexity of being the first in so many ways and for all the things that truly mattered. And yet somehow terminally late. She was both these things. Whatever her flaws, they paled to Elizabeth's traits that inspired so many. And if we keep digging, we get to something very specific, unique to Elizabeth, almost primal, her timeless sensuality. There is not a lesson in this trait. There is simply wonder. As has been noted, being a woman, a fully realized, sensual, powerful, desired woman, is the Elizabeth Taylor brand. question is a little bit is different. I'd like to know um, uh, which is the role of the perfume in the seduction? What is what? I'm sorry. Uh, the role of perfume in the seduction scene or in seduction in your life. So well, I think you should wear the perfume or the cologne anywhere you want to be touched. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> In the first 10 years that I worked for Elizabeth, I avoided telling people what I did with everything in me, because if I told somebody I worked for Elizabeth Taylor, the reaction was so big, so unbelievable, so unbelieving, I would have had a easier time convincing people that I worked for Santa Claus than Elizabeth Taylor. So I tried not to, but inevitably, there were times when I couldn't avoid it. So I came home one night. I lived in, a, came home from Elizabeth. One night I lived in a doorman building and there was an older man, older gentleman named Dan. So he asked me what I did and I told him I worked for Elizabeth Taylor. And he said, I have a story. He said, back in the 50s, I worked in a jewelry store at the Beverly Hills Hotel. One day, Elizabeth Taylor, Eddie Fisher, and Mike Todd came into the store. Mike and Eddie were in a corner talking business or whatever they were talking about. Elizabeth wanted to try in some jewelry. This necklace that she asked me to put on her coral. It was a mix of many, many, many different gemstones. And I know this necklace. She had it until the Christie sale. So he described the necklace and he said, so I put it on her and there was a clasp in the back and a chain. And he said, as I clasp it, my hand accidentally ran down her back a little bit. And he said, I was so turned on 
that I went home and had sex with my wife, passionate, mad, crazy sex, and we conceived our first child. One of the coolest things that she ever did for me, and I didn't ask her directly, it was done indirectly, she had a publicist named Shen Sam. And Shen was a lovely person, and we were talking, and I had been married to this woman for a period of time, not a very, very lengthy period of time, and I had a father-in-law. And like all father-in-laws, you know, you have to grudgingly work your way through the various stages to get to the point where you have genuine approval, and you know he really likes you. And he loved Elizabeth Taylor. So if there was anything that got me to a better position with him, it was clearly this idea, whoever this guy was who married my daughter, if he's got a job that he gets to do this, there must be something okay about him, if you would. So I told Shen the story that he had this birthday coming up, and it was an important one. And I just asked if she had a signed picture of Elizabeth Taylor, like that many celebrities will autograph pictures and they'll get sent to adoring fans. So Shen hands me a picture signed by Elizabeth Taylor that says, happy birthday, Howie. I'm sorry I'm going to miss the party, but I promise I'll be there for the next one. And he framed this picture with prominence in his office. And I know how much he liked it. And it was cool. You know, I could almost get emotional about it. I mean, he was a really good guy. I came to be very fond of him. And the truth of the matter was that it was a treasured gift that she gave me to give to him. And I will always be grateful for that. Taylor, what is seduction for you? Uh, What's your definition of seduction? And is it a game for you? No, I don't think seduction is a game. It can be playful. But um, I don't think, I don't believe in teasing. I think seduction should be serious, <laughs> although fun. Uh, seduction is what makes your stomach turn to water. If and when Elizabeth desired it, she had us all in the palm of her hand. This is how she moved mountains. It is how she influenced. But that kind of charisma should not always be used for power. Elizabeth certainly did not do that with hers. There's another lesson in here, a good lesson for influencers. Just like Elizabeth used her humor to knock things down a peg, she used her charisma to connect and interact with others, to engage them in a moment. She had the ability to take your hand and jump into a place of free-spirited childhood wonder and just play. She was so scrappy too, and could just get down with the best of them. Uh, She could stay up later than anybody, party harder than anybody, wake up earlier. She could do it. But I think that the other side of that was that side that was able to tap into the needs of others. Because I think that's where that fulfillment happens. That righteous rage was a moment where like belonging happened in that righteous rage, where you're standing up with people not just for people, but with people. That's, that's, to me, a spiritual experience. It's not of something, it's, 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 it's with, it's with, it's not for. She was just so good at all of that. And when it was time to wield that charisma to create change and bring all of her traits to bear with it, Elizabeth broke barriers. The, the concept of her, as you talk today about her being an influencer. Well, I mean, she was the ultimate influencer. I watched, and I think many people in America watched, you know, with AIDS, the fear and the horror because of the lack of understanding. When people don't understand things, it frightens them. The caring nature that that she genuinely displayed for people who had an illness that other people in the world weren't ready to go there where she was willing to be on the front lines of it and and to be there for them and to raise money. There isn't any influencer out there who's done anything remotely close to that. I hope in the story that's being told and that we get to be a part of telling that young people 
sees those moments in themselves, those truth telling moments in themselves, those moments of rage where they demand better for themselves and disregard your influencer status and do the right fucking thing. If Elizabeth was here today talking to the social media influencers, she would tell them to live their lives and enjoy their lives and that it's okay not to put everything out to the world. And this is a woman who knew what that was all about. She was forced into a position where she had to, at times, not explain herself, but she had to state her truth because so much was being written about her and so much was being put upon her. And so many people wanted to craft the story of her life that she would ha inevitably have to, uh, you know, take the narrative back and be truthful about things that might have been private, but she was open about it. That's really why she was the first influencer, because she was the first person who really spoke openly about what was going on in her life. Like when she went to rehab, there was no way that was going to remain a secret. So she announced it. So I am saying to the world, I'm going to get sober now. This is what I need to do. It's my personal business, but I'm telling you, this is how it is. When Elizabeth had brain surgery, Rather than having people make speculations and what's going on, she says, a cover of Life magazine, let Harry Benson photograph her bald and use the opportunity to say to women, look, it's okay. I'm bald and I look okay. And I've got my scar, but I'm not embarrassed of it. No matter what the influencers are doing, I think she would say to them, use your influence for good. It's fine that you have the influence. Those things happen. But at the end of the day, use it for good because that's the only reason to have social influence. Elizabeth made the choice as much as she could to have a world that was all of her own. And that's what she would encourage anybody who was an influencer to do. Make sure and have something that belongs just to you. Don't give it all away. Whether we have a million followers on social media or maybe don't even have a computer, we are all, in our own way, influencers. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? We could be wielding our influence like Elizabeth. We could be affecting change, real change, bringing good into the world. We could live by her example and use her roadmap. We could show our flaws rather than projecting images of perfection that we all know in our hearts are not real. We could be authentic. We could set an example of humanity for the people who look up to us. We could connect to others in generous ways with empathy. I know we could, we can, we must. Listen now to how Elizabeth speaks to young girls about a crisis in their time, about their own influence and how to use it. We can learn from the purity of this captured moment. Do condoms always work? Do condoms always work? Uh, well, I think it's about 99%, but it's certainly safer with a condom. But don't start yet. <laughs> can my school do anything to help? Uh, does your school have education about AIDS? No. Well, you could ask your mother and dad, dad to speak to the school about education if they believe it's important. I'm sure your parents have told you about it. Uh, but in the school is important too. People should talk about it. I was wondering why people with AIDS get treated so differently, like Magic Johnson. Because to be afraid and out of fear is born a kind of resentment. And that's really, really bad because the people with AIDS haven't done anything wrong. It's a disease and they should not be punished. They should be loved and we should give them compassion. And you can help there. 
What can you do to make people with AIDS feel better? Love them. Put your arms around them. Kiss them. Make them feel real and warm and loved. Love them. Make them feel loved. That is the core we've been peeling down to discover. Love is the singular element that drove every aspect of who Elizabeth was and is today. Love is the action that Elizabeth took to create change in the world. Love was her influence. Elizabeth Taylor loved. Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. Joshua Klieb wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese TV. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit elizabethtaylorAIDSFoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon by number one New York Times bestselling author, Kate Anderson Brower, will be out on December 6. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.